We are going to examine the book In Small Things Forgotten by James Deeds. In Small Things Forgotten is one of the best and most accessible books on the archaeology of colonial America. One of the many ideas that Dietz proposes is that the American colonial adventure followed a threefold development cycle. We are going to be discussing colonial America's relationship to the mother country, and I want to provide a quick note about the terms I use in reference to that country. England and Scotland unify in 1707, forming Great Britain. When referring to the colonies before 1707, I use English colonies. After 1707, I say British colonies. Okay, let's return to James Deets and the colonies. In his view, the English colonists that first came to Virginia, Massachusetts, and Maryland in the first part of the 17th century were essentially yeomen who were very similar to their kith and kin in England. So stage one is the first few generation of colonists that are very much tied to England for supplies, immigrants, and products. Dietz uses the term yeoman to describe the English culture of this stage so we will call this the yeoman stage. However, by the middle of the 17th century, the colonies were maturing economically, socially, and politically. The colonists had become more self-sufficient, and they were creating their own culture that was increasingly distinct from the mother country. This is a distinct phase, or stage two. We will call this the colonial self-sufficiency phase. At the outset of this phase, there is a kind of unofficial colonial independence as England is occupied in its own civil war between Charles I and Parliament. From the British Isles, the colonies are a distant affair as parties in England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland are engaged in a terrible conflict. However, following the restoration of the monarchy after Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth period, there is an effort in England to consolidate the realm in the latter 17th century. The colonies were gradually brought back into the cultural, economic, and political sphere of the mother country. We can call this third stage the re-Anglicization phase. As the 17th century progresses, the British colonies increasingly become re-tethered to the British Isles. In this model, the ironic thing is that the colonies enter the revolutionary period of the 1760s and 1770s during the time when they were the most connected to the mother country since the first generation of colonists in the early 17th century. It's the ultimate full circle story. Before we dive further into Dietz's threefold cycle, I would like to show you a, a helpful tool to find great ideas in other history books. We are all busy and sometimes it's hard to find the time we would like to dive into a great book. However, Blinkist is an app that allows you to understand the most important things from over 5,500 nonfiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. I am currently refreshing myself on the book 1491 by Charles C. Mann. I have actually read this book a few times over the last decade or so. I like sharing this book with others and with Blinkist Connect a feature that allows access for two accounts for just one premium plan, I can share my reads with a friend. I can select my library on the left side panel, which brings up the books I have bookmarked. In addition to 1491, you can see that I am going through key points on Benjamin Franklin's biography by Walter Isaacson, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, and the book There Was Light, a biography on Abraham Lincoln by John Meacham. Blinkist provides critical points that are presented in these books, all delivered in bite-sized quantities that you can either read or have read to you. Get 25% off Blinkist Premium and enjoy two memberships for the price of one. Start your seven-day free trial by clicking on the link in the description. Let's return to James Deeds. In the early years of the English colonies, say 1625, we have Jamestown in Virginia and Plymouth in Massachusetts. These early colonies are populated by residents that are just recently arrived from England, and they are largely dependent on the mother country for supplies, political support, and new immigrants. However, in a place like Jamestown, changes are coming. In the 1610s, John Rolfe has successfully introduced tobacco into Virginia, 
providing the colony with its first cash crop. And by the 1620s, there is a new sense of economic independence. It's no longer a one-way street from England to America, as the colonies have a money-making product that the mother country is very interested in. In addition, skilled workers are arriving in America, bringing skilled labor like blacksmiths to American villages. And then the English Civil War gets going in the 1640s. England has its own major issues to work through, and the American colonies essentially function independently. However, two major events will happen in the latter 17th century to draw the colonies back into the sphere of the mother country. The period of the colonial drift from England will continue, but these events will slow the drift and ultimately reverse it. With the end of the English Civil War period and Cromwell's Protectorate era, the English monarchy is restored after 11 years. This new era, the restoration of the monarchy, is a sea change in relations between England and her colonies. King Charles II enacts Navigation Acts in 1660. King Charles II does not want the colonies acting so independently as they had been trading with the French, Spanish, and the Dutch. Charles wants the English colonists to stop trading with these rival powers in order to keep the wealth within the realm of England. The Navigation Acts require that English goods from America are exported back to England and not to rival powers. So the year 1660 marks the beginning of a gravitational pull that is now slowly drawing the colonies from their drift back into the English system. So now, at least on paper, colonists are supposed to ship goods back to England only. Another critical event is Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia. Nathaniel Bacon's 1676 rebellion against Governor Berkeley shook the whole colony. There was widespread violence uh, between rebels, the colonial government, and local native tribes. Jamestown itself was under attack. The chaos and violence in Virginia demanded more direct action and control from the King of England. The colonies are no longer going to be doing their own thing, and the king will have more direct oversight. Dietz likens the relationship between the colonies and the British Isles to a trajectory of a rocket. By the mid-17th century, the colonies gain a sense of economic, social, and political self-sufficiency, blasting off into a new and distinct cultural landscape. However, after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, followed by the Navigation Acts and then Bacon's Rebellion, that climb towards autonomy has run out of energy, and like gravity, the rocket, in this example, colonial America's independence, falls back to Earth. The 18th century, the final stage of the colonial period, will see the British colonies ever more pulled back into Britain's sphere. Britain, by about 1750, is entering the first industrial period, and a major product of that era is refined earthenware ceramics. Refined earthenware ceramics had been a luxury for aristocracy, but they're now widely available by about 1760, produced in Staffordshire, England. These creamwares and pearlwares are heavily imported into the American colonies, and they mark the widespread practice of British tea time. Indeed, other authors have commented that the American colonists in 1763, following British victory in the French and Indian War, were proudly patriotic and deeply loyal to Great Britain. From this perspective, the rapid transformation toward the American Revolution from about 1765 thus comes at a very ironic time. The American colonies had never been so thoroughly British as they were during the Revolutionary period. After all, the reason the Boston Tea Party occurred at all is because Americans were tea drinkers like their compatriots in the mother country. Dietz brings in archaeological evidence to support his threefold division of colonial history. In addition to the importation of refined ceramics, architecture in America by the middle 18th century in America is reflecting the Georgian style of the British Enlightenment. The Georgian style house 
the symmetrical architectural style of well-to-do colonial Americans is named after King George. One might even say that the American Revolution and the demand for liberty is a product of the British Enlightenment. In other words, there was never something so British than citizens clamoring for more rights and liberties. From a philosophical perspective, we could also name the adoption of John Locke's political philosophy, Sir Isaac Newton's scientific revolution, and Adam Smith's capitalism as other influences from Britain that dramatically impacted the thinking of the Founding Fathers. I think this threefold division of American colonial history is an interesting take on the colonial past. The only issue that I see with it is that he refers to the first phase of the colonial experience as medieval. Jamestown was founded in 1607, Plymouth was founded in 1620, and Massachusetts Bay, Boston, was founded in 1630. I would contend that these settlements, the first generation of successful English occupation in North America, are definitely post-medieval in form and function. Martin Luther and the Reformation were almost a hundred years before these events, and Columbus was even older than that. Italian painters and artists had been doing art that one would consider Renaissance for centuries before the time the English arrive in North America. I would describe the first phase of colonization in the 17th century as Stuart, Renaissance, or early modern, not medieval. But I'm sort of nitpicking. James Dietz has a great book called In Small Things Forgotten. It's a great synthesis of colonial archaeology and history. You can find critical points on other great books on Blinkist, such as Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, 1491 by Charles C. Mann, and the biography on Benjamin Franklin by Walter Isaacson.